Welcome to the class. This is uh, Introduction to Psychology. My name is Eric Silk. I'm the professor for this class. Introduction to Psychology is a fascinating class for students to take, but oftentimes this material is very hard, so I don't want you to be caught off guard when we start here and we really start to talk about science a lot. So psychology is a science. We're going to talk about a number of different areas. As a professor, um, introduction to Psychology is legitimately the hardest class I teach. It's because we go over so much material in such a short period of time, um, it's really difficult. Unfortunately, Introduction to Psychology has a problem nationwide and that a lot of students fail this class. Um, you don't need to fail. One thing, you got to do the work. If you do the work in the class, you'll be okay. Uh, two, you've got to read the book. So every class you have has a book that's assigned. Read those books. I'm gonna try and do screencasts like this for a number of different chapters. You'll typically have two screencasts for about half an hour. I'll watch those and then you'll have screencasts from the book as well. So all the materials should overlap. I'll supplement the class with a number of different videos, watch those and participate in the discussion uh, section of the class. Those are your keys to success. On that note, we should probably get started. Um, so, the first thing in this class is what is psychology? Let's start the screencast. Psychology is a scientific study of the behavior of an individual and their mental processes. So, when we see the word Ology, we know that's a science, and then psych means psyche or mind, not like psycho. So this is the scientific study of the mind. We use the scientific method as psychologists. This is a process that we use that is very specific and we use this to answer questions and solve problems. But this is how you answer questions in a scientific manner. So this procedure allows us to gather and interpret objective information. Note objective versus subjective. So we want to remove as much bias as possible and minimize error so we can get results that are reliable and we can depend on generalizations from those results. So this is just a quick little schematic of what the scientific method is. The first thing is that somebody comes up with a question. They have an idea, they want something answered. Now I could just give you my opinion and that's what a lot of people do. And a lot of people in the field of psychology do that too. But we wanna go beyond that. What we wanna do is develop a hypothesis or hypotheses. And this is a question that we can figure out some sort of procedure or an experiment where we can gather data and then have some empirical findings or conclusions when we can either uh, accept or reject the hypotheses at that point. If we uh, finish our study, we might develop new hypotheses or change or revise our hypotheses and the wheel will keep spinning. But this is how we gather objective data in the social sciences so our results aren't just based on opinion. Now we're going to talk a lot about behavior. What is behavior? Well behavior is something that is overt, something that is observable something that you can measure. That's what a behavior is. And psychologists are oftentimes concerned with behavior. Look at animals and humans and look at the ways that they adjust to their environment. That's what behavior is. So what does this giraffe do? How does it get its food? What does it do? It's those observable things. That's what behavior is. But there's something more. I mean, what's going on in that giraffe's head? What's going on in your head right now? Do you have thoughts? Are you thinking? Can we observe your thoughts? 
Can we measure your thinking? Now, that's a little different. In psychology, that's what we call a cognition. Cognition refers to the private internal workings of the mind. We can study that as well. Now, the primary goal is to improve and understand behavior and cognition. And the goal of the psychologist conducting basic research is to describe, explain, predict, and or control behavior and or cognition. So psychologists work in a scientific method and they gather data. What behavioral data are is reports about observation and behavior under the conditions which they occur. Now, researchers will choose the appropriate level of analysis in which to study behavior. I mean, a psychologist could be looking at DNA and looking at uh, the DNA and behavior, but they might also look at society as a whole. So from the cellular to the societal level, there's a whole range of analysis in which you can study behavior. Now, again, this word objective comes up a lot. We want our uh, findings to be objective. We don't want them to be subjective or biased. And we strive to maintain objectivity in our measures of behavioral data. So descriptions describe what happened. Explanations look kind of how to, uh, the how behavior works. Psychologists might look at internal factors, might look at uh, genetic makeup, motivation, intelligence, external factors, or even situational factors. So those things uh, likely to explain the how of behavior. Now scientific prediction, or what's going to happen, is based on an understanding of the way that events relate to one another. Now what we're trying to typically do is suggest a mechanism that links certain events together. This is called a causal prediction, like A leads to B, or A and B lead to C. Now, causal predictions are kind of difficult. Um, oftentimes, we can't say that specific behaviors or specific uh, cognitions are caused by uh, very specific genetics or internal factors. What we look at more is relationships between measures. And we call that a correlation. So think about correlation versus causation. That's going to come up later. That's going to be very important. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Plato. And men like Plato, uh, philosophers, have been asking questions for a long, long time. And a lot of these questions are some of the basic things that we look at in the field of psychology. Plato asked, how does the mind work? This guy, Aristotle, asked questions like, what is the nature of free will? Do we have free will? That's on your discussion for this week. And lots of ancient um, religions, Hindus, religions and philosophies, like Buddhism have asked questions that are very similar to the field of psychology. However, if we look at the early roots of modern psychology, the field doesn't go back that far. So really, uh, our historical figures, I'm sure you've heard of Sigmund Freud, we'll talk about him later on. He uh, really published some, uh, his first works right at the beginning of the 1900s. And this guy, Herman Ebbinghaus, has a very famous quote that says, psychology has a long history, but a short past. There's Ebbinghaus right there. And we're gonna differentiate between the school of structuralism and the school of functionalism and talk about the early roots of psychology. One of my favorite psychologists, and this is somebody whose name you're probably gonna have to know, is Wilhelm Wundt. That's him right there. Now, Vunt was very different. I love this guy. This is what I wish people knew of as a field of psychology. He's really the pioneer of a field called physiological psychology. So there's Vunt in his laboratory right there. 
He's a German fellow, so his laboratory was in Leipzig, Germany. And he used equipment, you can see that right there, to measure some very basic physiological processes. And that's what he was studying. So he was using measurements, he was observing behavior, collecting data in a very objective way to yield conclusions. I mean, he was looking at things like hearing, the ability to tell the difference between intensities of light, stuff like that. And Vunt ended up training many, many famous psychologists. So his uh, school that he represents is structuralism. Structuralism is a concept of the mind and reductionism becomes very important. What reductionism means is that we can reduce all human ex experiences and we can understand them as a comb combination of simple elements or events. So we break things down into their structures and look at individual pieces. So Vunt is very famous for this. He had his first, uh, the first person to develop an experimental laboratory. Titchener was a student of Vunt's. He brought structuralism to America. And Max Wertheimer later on went on to develop the concepts in Gestalt psychology. We'll learn about that later. Now in contrast is someone very different. His name is William James. William James is a father of American psychology. Here's a quote from William James. To perceive the world differently, we must be willing to change our belief system. Let the past slip away, expand our sense of now, and dissolve the fear in our minds. I really like that quote. William James did things quite differently from Vunt. He represents a school of functionalism. Now functionalism goes the opposite way. Instead of being reductionistic, it looks at the mind and tries to figure out the purpose and property of that mind. So the function of mind and behavior is a result of the organism's interaction with the environment. Like what's the greater picture? John Dewey is another famous psychologist and uh, he's responsible for developing progressive education in the United States. Now, other psychologists that are important in the history of psychology, one is G. Stanley Hall. He founded the American Psychological Association in 1892. Margaret Washburn was the first female to earn a doctoral degree in psychology in 1894. Psychology is a very popular major today. Um, we just had commencements at my university this weekend. Uh, there were a huge number of psychology majors. In my classes, I would estimate that it's probably 80% female, 20% male. There's more women today that are obtaining advanced degrees in the field, but historically, this was a very male-dominant field. That's not the case anymore. So there's G. Stanley Hall. And there's Margaret Washburn. Oh. Now, here's a whole list of different perspectives. I wish there was just one, but there's not. There's many different perspectives in the field of psychology. We're going to need to go into detail into all of these. Typically, we'll break them down, and each will get its own chapter. So the psychodynamic perspective, behaviorist perspective, humanistic, cognitive, biological, evolutionary, and sociocultural, they all have a very different way of looking at the field of psychology. Most psychologists will focus in one specific area. I mean, me personally, I like the biological and cognitive perspective um, but all of the perspectives can give you a unique insight into the field of psychology. So we're going to continue uh, lecture one with part two, and we'll go into detail with each of these perspectives.